Uh, my name is Kevin Nelson. I'm the executive director of the BC Libraries Cooperative. On behalf of the co-op, on behalf of the BC Libraries Association, on behalf of Public Library Interlink, I'd like to welcome you to the second of our five-part series of Libraries in the Global Arena, The Climate Emergency and Mental Wellness. Now, I'm calling in to you today from the unceded territory, the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh people. I'm going to invite you, if you want, to uh, pop into the chat the territory that you're calling in from. I know we're all in different places, probably across British Columbia, but also perhaps uh, from a wider geographic scope than that. I have a couple of housekeeping items to walk us through, and then I want to return to a connection between our conversation today, the climate crisis, and uh, reconciliation and land. So just a couple of quick housekeeping items. Uh, the session, as some of you saw, is being recorded and it'll be up on the BCLA YouTube account next week where the first session is as well, the one we had with Seth Klein. We're going to be taking questions during the presentation and I'll ask you to post them in the chat. Uh, we're gonna be collecting those. Uh, Rachel's gonna be talking for about 30 minutes or so. Uh, and then we're going to move into questions. So hoping there's a good deal of time to get into uh, your curiosities. I'm going to ask you to mute your microphones if you can during the presentation. Feel free to have your video on or off your call. If your video is on, just note that your image may be captured in the recording. And we have enabled closed caption. So to turn on closed captioning, uh, click on the live transcription option at the bottom of the video. Just note that this is uh, a feature that's using artificial intelligence. And so it's not a completely accurate transcription, but it's pretty good. Um, so uh, please feel free to use that. Okay, uh, I wanna welcome Rachel Molina Chan. Rachel is the co-founder and creative director of Eco Anxious Stories. Uh, it's a project devoted to sharing creative expressions of eco anxiety in order to make people feel less alone in our concerns about the climate crisis. And her research on climate engagement focuses on narrative theory as a bridge between what matters, what's at stake, what we want, and what it'll take. In a minute, uh, Rachel's gonna do a deep dive uh, with us into her work. I just wanted to circle back to the connecting point I mentioned before. I met Rachel in 2013 in Saskatoon. At the time, I had co-founded and I was helping to grow a national leadership program for young people across this country who were passionate about social and environmental justice. And for those of you who do get to do any sort of facilitative or educational work, there's always folks that you come across that you meet who have such uh, a creative drive, curiosity, um, are synthesizing information in such a way that you get excited and curious about where they're gonna go in their journeys and where the work is gonna take them. And I always felt that way when I was working with Rachel uh, eight years ago. And so it's just a real honor in a way to be able to work with you now as a peer and a colleague and to welcome you um, at this table in, in this manner. And then here's the connecting point. I was actually reading just this morning about an initiative in Saskatchewan, which is Rachel's home province. It's called the uh, Land Sharing Network, the Treaty Land Sharing Network. And it is a project with ranchers, farmers, and First Nations in Saskatchewan working together on how to share land and access to land. And one of the farmers who was working on this initiative said something really important. She said that she realizes that treaty land was not about surrender. Treaties were not about surrendering land. They were about sharing land. And that this initiative, I think, will be one small step around reconciliation, around decolonization. And here's the climate link for me. Only about 2% of the global land base is under the direct stewardship of Indigenous peoples. But we know that Indigenous peoples when they have stewardship of land, that that land is more sustainable, is better cared for, and is better for people and planet than land which is not. And so for me, this was just a, a small, beautiful example of reconciliation, climate action, decolonization, inaction, which provides for me a little bit of an element of hope. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Rachel. 
Thank you so much, Kevin. Thanks for that intro. And thanks for the, the callback to our, our roots. Um, it's interesting putting together these notes. It's, it's work I do all the time and that I've been doing pretty much since eight, eight years ago when I started getting involved in more eco and social justice work. Um, but I'm pretty sure Kevin Millsip was the very person to introduce me to some of these storytelling frameworks that uh, I still use today. Uh, in my work and in my uh, in my eco anxiety uh, activism, uh, and so thank you so much for for that legacy, Kevin, and for uh, seeing all these uh, dots kind of connect today. It's really exciting. Thank you to everyone who is on the call already and who uh, who took time to, to be with us here over this hour. Um, it's going to be a, a, a quick conversation, I think, and then, and like I said, some time for questions at the end. We're not going to do any breakout groups uh, for this session, so if that was maybe filling you with a little bit of anxiety, you can kind of let that go. Um, and, but we will have some time to hear from you throughout the presentation uh, through some polls and, uh, and questions. Uh, so I want to just build a little bit on that that great intro and and take a little bit of time on this intro slide here to just situate myself in this conversation so that you know exactly what you're getting into and and what kind of uh, perspective I'm coming here with. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to be talking about the climate emergency and mental wellness, um, but we're going to be looking at it through the lens of narrative and storytelling. Uh, and so I'm going to go to a tried and true method of storytelling that I think we all learned in about second grade, the five W's. Uh, to kind of situate myself in my lens here today. So you know who I am. I'm Rachel Molina Chan. Uh, you know a bit about what I am. I'm the co-founder and creative director of Eco Anxious Stories, and I'll be talking a lot about that project throughout the presentation today. Where I am is uh, is on the slide here too. I'm, I'm coming to you from downtown Victoria, BC, uh, and that's the traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking peoples, um, the Songhees and the Esquimalt nations. And as Kevin uh, introduced so well, the connections between the material I'm talking about today and the fact that I am here, and this is the setting of my story, um, they're deeply linked. Uh, and the, the ways of thinking and, and the types of values that I wanna bring forward today in the presentation, these are things that have shaped and, um, and really powered Indigenous communities for millennia. And, and it's really been a lens, um, broadly speaking, that, that has been devalued in, in the histories that I'm from uh, and from a Western tradition. So I just want to put that out there at first, that I'm, I'm speaking about these things here today, but I'm really um, trying to do that with some humility, that, that these aren't necessarily ancestrally um, things that I have as close relationship to as other cultures. Um, but storytelling is a universal uh, idea and a universal um, factor of our of our relationships, and so I'm excited to to make that connection to climate change today, uh, and and the the when I am um, when we all are is uh, at the end of a week that started with the IPCC report uh, coming out, and, and and I think that's salient as well. I know our our registration numbers for the um, webinar about doubled since Monday, and it was actually a total coincidence. I believe that that this particular topic was coming up this week. Um, but when we realized that we are a few days after the um, the release of some pretty heavy news about where we're at in the climate crisis, um, that this would be a timely conversation. And so I just want to um, just let you know that and validate you that the anxieties that you might be feeling if that brought you here today. Before I get to the why, I want to talk a little bit about what I'm not, uh, so that we can kind of cover that W as well. Um, like I said, we're, we're talking about the climate emergency and mental, well, mental wellness, um, but I am not a climate scientist. I didn't come from a natural sciences or a hard science background. And my work on the climate emergency um, really has more to do with, with public narratives and social change um, related to this crisis. Uh, and I was trained in political science and for my undergrad, and that's really an exploration of how power shapes our relationships with each other. Uh, and from there, I went on to grad school to look at community health and population health science. And that's a kind of a fancy way of talking about how our relationships impact our health. Uh, and so we've got power and relationships and health as sort of this um, space that I'm in. I'm not a mental health therapist or a trained uh, in you know, evidence-based approaches to individual therapy, um, but we're speaking today about making meaning out of these feelings that we're having and, and how commonplace and how normal it is to feel anxious about um, the state of the climate crisis right now and how we, how we sustain ourselves in that, how we take care of each other in that, uh, and how we really build out um, spaces of community care uh, in what feels like the end of the world. And this graphic here is uh, a piece that was done by Megan Mast and her friend Joni. They created this beautiful zine series about self-care, community care, and earth care. And you'll see some of the, the images from that piece um, throughout the presentation. 
Okay, so you've heard my who, who, what, where, when, and what not. And I'm just gonna talk now about um, the why. Let's see here. Okay, so our goals for today. I'm here today in part because I was invited and I'm so grateful to the BC Libraries Association and the co-op um, for having me today. I do want to focus today on, on a new way of thinking about climate and mental health. And, and new has an asterisk, because as I was mentioning before, these ways of thinking and knowing are far from new, um, but they're newly emerging as, as mainstream concepts in the climate movement and in society at large. And so um, I'm hoping that you can leave today feeling a bit more acquainted with the intersections between these really, really big disciplines and, and big issues. Secondly, we're gonna use narrative to really dig into the heart of this issue, talking about values and emotions and how this operates both personally at an individual level, but also ripples out into our, our myths and dominant narratives that shape our lives. Uh, and I wanna leave you equipped to um, tell your own eco-anxious story as well. Um, this, this project that I've started with my brother-in-law, who's also named Kevin, um, we are uh, really trying to focus on normalizing these feelings and bringing them into a space of, ex of creative expression so that everyone feels like they have um, a, a story to tell and a, a, a part to play in this grand narrative that we're all a part of. Uh, and this really stemmed for me from, from the work I was doing in my grad studies um, in community health. I was in this space where you know, we're trying to prepare ourselves as public health leaders and, and medical professionals to really tackle the, the health crises of, of the next generation. Uh, and yet I wasn't hearing about climate change at all in that space. And, and when I would look into, you know, why, what are the barriers to talking about and working on climate, on climate issues, I heard a lot about, um, this was five or six years ago, I heard a lot about how people just don't know enough or don't care enough to take action. Uh, and I was in a space with people who really cared and who seemed to understand and accept the science, um, but we were all still feeling really paralyzed and unsure of, of how to make a difference. Uh, and so I, I started to look at narrative as a way of framing this kind of complex tangle of things that's happening where we, uh, we want to do something meaningful, but we, we, we struggle to, to get there. So why focus on eco-anxiety? This is really the, the question that um, Kevin uh, and I were, were wrestling with when we started this. Uh, and to, to me and to us, it was about meeting people where they're at. And this is uh, a recent poll from this summer from Angus Reid that uh, identified two top issues for Canadians right now heading into um, the political cycle that we're headed into are environment and climate change and healthcare. So this intersection between you know, our relationship with the lands that we live on and the way that we are equipped to handle the crises that, we've, uh, that we're facing uh, in health and well-being, this is really, this is a, a rich territory for us to be in right now. Uh, and perhaps you came here today because some of these other boxes are, are, of evidence are resonating with you as well. Um, psychosocial responses to climate change are really complicated. Uh, and the research is, so, is showing that this isn't a, a simple, you know, take this coping mechanism or pop this pill and you're going to not feel eco-anxious anymore. Um, the responses that we have to hearing that are the world as we know it is changing rapidly and often for the worse. Um, this is really uh, jarring and this is it's difficult to manage. Um, and it's also happening to people who are on the front lines of you know, eco and social justice um, already, it's hurting them the most marginalized people and people who depend the most on the land or who are the most vulnerable to a lack of structures and systems to protect them and their health. Um, these consequences are, are really impacting them the first and, and worst. And so perhaps you're motivated by this issue because you know climate change is a justice issue. Perhaps that's where some of your anxiety is coming from, is feeling a lot of pain about the fact that people today, not just in the future, but today are experiencing really harmful impacts of the climate crisis. And the bottom one there in the brown box um, talks about how this is really impacting children and youth. Uh, and maybe you have a child or you are thinking about having children or, or you work with children. And, and this is something um, that's on your heart because you don't know how to manage that or you don't know how to manage the feelings that are, are coming out of the small people in your, uh, in your life. Uh, and so there's a lot of evidence to show that this is a really important topic. Uh, most of this evidence is from the last year or two, and, uh, and I'm excited to see all the attention on this work, uh, and I suspect that perhaps it's what, um, yeah, helped motivate you to come out today. 
the evidence really shows us that this is a normal experience. And I don't think we need the evidence to, to assert that, you know, the, the idea that you would be concerned that the things that you depend on for, for a beautiful life would be threatened like that should cause anxiety. And so one thing that most of us in this field to try to really emphasize is that eco-anxiety is normal. It's not the result of you having something wrong with you individually or biologically. Uh, it can certainly interact with and exacerbate acute mental health issues. So speaking as a non-professional, I would definitely um, still encourage folks to, to seek out that care if they feel like they need support with coping day to day. Um, but for lots of us, this is sort of a reality of our lives and we're trying to figure out how to move forward uh, and not necessarily just keep suppressing these feelings, but figure out where they fit in a meaningful way um, day to day. Uh, so over two thirds, this is an American context from the American Psychiatric Association, but more than two thirds of Americans were reported to experience at least some eco-anxiety and almost half of young people, 18 to 34, are feeling like it's affecting them every day. So this is a very serious issue that, um, you know, if you are in this group, these groups, you're in good company. And uh, this isn't to say that we shouldn't be concerned with this, quite the opposite. But this isn't a pathology. This isn't a disease you have. And, and we don't need to treat this as um, a medical concern. Um, but we can still intercede upon some of the most um, harmful impacts that we're feeling. And so this is where I want to emphasize um, where I'm coming from on this and where you going to story sort of fits in this is that climate emotions aren't just showing up in the clinic. They're not just showing up on the psychiatric couch. Um, they're really shaping our connections and our cultures. Uh, and so this is where eco anxious stories is sort of situated is in more of this cultural space where we're trying to frame out narratives about the climate crisis, as well as about how we're feeling about it. Uh, and so there's a lot going on here and there's a lot to, to talk about. Uh, and it can't just be in the realm of psychology, even though those are incredibly important professionals to, to access uh, and to uplift. Um, we, are, we are working on this in a, in a cultural space as well. And with that, this isn't really just an individual problem. Again, you can find individual supports and, and we work hard on our site and, and others um, to create coping mechanisms and tips for really managing those acute feelings. When you have that day or that your, you know, your whole Twitter thread is just, the whole Twitter, Twitter feed is really um, stressful information. There's lots of tips for, for tuning into those feelings and trying to, to work your way through them. But at a grander scale, we're really talking here about collective healing collective grieving uh, and these collective stories. So trying to find that linkage between our personal narratives and, um, and the public narratives that make us feel often powerless. And this is just two really great groups that I'd love for you to check out if you are in that space of wanting to dig a little bit more into your grief or your sense of dread about um, what's to come. Uh, the Good Grief Network it has a 10-step program that really helps walk through digging into these feelings and making the connection to justice issues and, uh, and to um, existential issues and spiritual issues. Um, Jen Dredd is uh, run by Britt Ray, who's a postdoc also doing research on this topic. And she has a really great newsletter that she publishes with latest readings and tips uh, and, uh, and works quite a bit with the Climate Psychiatric Association. They have a really good list of climate aware psychiatrists um, as well. So those are two great pro projects to check out. Before I turn it over to you folks to tell me how your eco-anxious stories are shaping up, I do wanna just really quickly give you a sense of just how beautiful this, this sort of community of people is that is um, writing about these topics and researching these topics. Uh, each of these individuals has had an impact on how I view this, this issue. Uh, and I, I just wanna encourage you to, to check them out if you are um, interested as well. Glenn Albrecht, uh, I'll just say a quick word about each of them. He, he does great work on trying to conceptualize our feelings about ecological degradation um, by coming up with new words, like not just relying on tagging eco onto things, but actually embracing this really unique moment that we're in uh, and coming up with terminology that reflects that. So solastalgia is a term that refers to the idea of being homesickness, being homesick while you're still at home, uh, seeing your, your whole um, community or your environment change right before your eyes and feeling that sense of loss even before it's happened perhaps or while it's happening. And so it gives you that, that kind of wrinkle in time effect of like this eco-anxiety is both happening because of things that are happening here and now, um, but also what we see happening or what could happen in the future. And so I think celestalgia is a really useful term to kind of link your, get your head around that. 
Caroline Hickman uh, does some really great work on child mental health and climate change, and she has great tips for how to talk to children about the climate crisis. Um, Katie Hayes is working on some really great work that looks at which kind of populations are actually experiencing this differently than others. Um, and her work with Ashley Consolo looks at Inuit communities and how um, they are being impacted uh, in particular um, by having um, so much warming in, in, their, in their region. Mary Heglar does great work linking climate crisis, the climate crisis to racism, uh, and she does has this great essay. She's a she's an essayist, and she writes about how um, the climate crisis isn't the first existential crisis that people of color have experienced, and that eco anxiety in some ways can be kind of co opted by privileged white people who are quite afraid of having their current reality altered because they currently hold a lot of power in that reality. Uh, and she just really helped me reframe um, this topic from that perspective and would encourage you to check out her work. As well as the work of Ariel Derringer, who uh, talks about kind of as Kevin was saying, um, really the leadership role of indigenous peoples on keeping lands um, sustained to where they are now, but also um, turning to their, their ways of knowing and turning to their leadership um, to, to forge paths forward. And to finish it off, Renee Lertzman, last but not least, she's just really influenced um, a lot of people's thinking on this stuff. She writes quite a bit about environmental psychology. And she, her big thing is empathy and that we really need to empathize with people when they are feeling anxious and even when they're expressing apathy or denial, um, because those are defense mechanisms that can be uh, grounded really easily in psychological theory. Uh, and so she encourages people to, to gain that emotional intelligence and really help meet people where they're at. Okay, so I want to hear from you all, and I believe we're going to throw a poll up on the screen so that um, you can kind of weigh in. We have some predetermined choices here for you. This is the only way we could do the poll, um, but feel free to use the chat if you've got some other emotions that aren't showing up on the list. You can choose multiple answers if lots of these are resonating with you, and we just want to get a feel on how you're feeling about climate change these days. I think you got about 30 seconds here. There you go. Okay, there's a few of you who haven't participated, but lots of you did. Um, and it's clear that there's a lot of mixed feelings. I mean, there's a lot of overlapping feelings too, I imagine. Um, but some of the top ones are anxious, uh, afraid, depressed, grief. Um, there's some more positive, arguably emotions like connected and activated at the bottom here um, that were not selected as often. Um, so there's a lot of um, there's a lot of feelings out there about this, and I encourage you to keep asking yourself that question regularly because this can change all the time. But it's really useful to tap into um, your feelings as a bit of an entry point for understanding where where your story is at. Um, and I want to just tell you that um, you're not alone in any of these feelings, especially those of you who expressed feeling anxious uh, or afraid or or depressed about this. Um, there is a lot of people in your camp. Uh, and it's it's really where we try to frame out eco-anxious stories, um, like I said, as an entry point so that we can kind of use that feeling as a, as a way to get closer to other feelings that you might uh, also be feeling underneath that anxiety. Uh, and we invite people to share their stories so that we can understand how other people are making the link between what they feel, uh, what they love, and what they do. Um, so this is a um, quote that we posted recently from Sarah, uh, who shared her story with us. She was the woman on the blue image on one of my earlier slides. Uh, and Sarah had an experience up close with the, with the climate crisis, fleeing a fire. Um, I believe this was a couple of years ago. And she was really afraid for her two-year-old daughter's life. Um, she was really afraid um, for her own life. And, and, and it drove her to really want to reach out to other parents and other people who are um, experiencing anxiety about the climate crisis, but who are also taking really exciting um, action on it. Uh, and so that helped her, that connection with other people who, who worked sort of on her wavelength and sort of knew what she was going through um, was a huge part of her managing her own anxiety and, and making something meaningful out of it. 
So if we're in this climate narrative and we feel these feelings because we acknowledge and we uh, recognize and accept the, 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 what the science is telling us, um, that feeling of anxiety is a great way to kind of get into the story and be like, okay, I am a character in this narrative and something is happening, but it doesn't always tell you who you are and what your role is in that story. So this is a very um, crude way of, of determining a little bit about who you are in this narrative, but I've given you an extreme here, a climate denier being a one and a climate expert being a 10. And I just wanna know how you'd rank yourself in this climate story on that scale. And I think we're gonna, yeah, throw another poll up there. You only get one answer this time. Okay, we're close to 90% here. Um, lots of you are in the six, seven, eight range, a couple tens and nines, um, a couple, we got one, one. Uh, anyone under a five, feel free to just keep your questions to email with me um, for this presentation in particular. We'll, we'll kind of let people who are feeling a little more confident about the science um, speak uh, for that portion of the day. But everyone else, I'm not surprised um, where you found yourself. Um, most of us don't consider ourselves experts. And if you do, that's awesome. And I would love to hear about your expertise. Um, but there's a bit of a trick question. And because this story and your role in it has less to do with who you are and more to do with when you are. And so this is something we talk about a lot at Equanimous Stories is really claiming this narrative um, in context and really saying, you know, you you are here and you belong to this movement by by rights of what you love and how you feel about this. And that has a lot more to do with when you are in this story than, than who you are. Um, I often talk about how I was born about a month before um, James Hansen presented to the US Senate about the climate crisis and, and how serious it was and how quickly they needed to act in order for what we're seeing today with forest fires and, and sea, sea uh, level rise, et cetera, happening. Um, and so that helps me put this into context that you know this, this problem started before I was born um, and it is still here and worsening um, now that I'm a more of a, an adult with more agency in the world. Um, and that that's relevant to how I feel about this and what I can do about it. Um, and it, it doesn't give me a pass, but for me, um, knowing that I am not to blame, but I am at hand is really helpful as a way to kind of reframe my anxiety and move away from those feelings of guilt that can often de debilitate or demobilize, immobilize. Um, so, so thinking about when you are in this story uh, is important. The when and the where so often get left out of our intros, um, but it's really key to ground yourself in exactly what moment in time you're in. Uh, and the good news is this is an extremely important moment in time. This is a chapter where everything changes uh, and you are part of the transition generation by the mere fact that your heart is beating. And so I want you to really feel that today and leave this, this presentation knowing that you are a part of this story, even if you haven't exactly found out what that means in terms of your daily actions, um, you, are, you are here where you belong. Okay, last, oh, I have one more slide on this. Okay, this is, this is good because I want to talk more about how um, eco-anxious stories really tries to bring people along in this. And, and so our, our framework for, for sharing stories always centers around people's feelings and, and what they really care about um, because that's, that's good, interesting storytelling. When you have conflict about something that's really important to you, that's basically the, the, the plot line of most of the, the movies and TV shows that you likely engage with. Um, and so it's all about connecting the dots between what we know and what we think about in our heads, what we care about, what we love in our hearts, uh, and what we do with our hands and feet. Uh, and Gans talks about this, Marshall Gans, who, whose storytelling frameworks I build a lot of my work out of. Um, shout out to Kevin, thank you so much. Um, but he has this great quote that's in the corner of the slide here, that narrative is the discursive means we use to access values that equip us with the courage to make choices under conditions of uncertainty, to exercise agency. So that feeling of eco-anxiety, it, it, it makes us feel like we're an agent in this narrative, but to actually exercise that agency and to not be restrained by all the contingencies in this story, we need to find those values that really make us tick, that really motivate us to do anything, to get out of bed in the morning. Um, and that we and to focus on the choices that we have 
in this story, uh, because the climate crisis isn't a, a, a problem of technology anymore. This isn't a matter of knowing how we could solve it, what would be positive or negative in terms of the crisis that we're facing. This has everything to do with choices and the choices of powerful people. Uh, and so we, we try to use storytelling at Eco Anxious Stories to help people tap into their power, to talk about the connections they have with other people and how they're linking up to enhance that power. Uh, and they're doing it from all different kinds of walks of life. So definitely browse our site if you wanna check out videos or podcasts or other work. Um, that blogs, other stuff that we're that we're cooking up to to help show just how um, broad and deep and and diverse this this uh, story really is. All right, now our last question. I, I, now that I know that you're in the story and that you have a role to play, I want to know a little bit more about how you feel about that and what uh, how you feel about what you're doing. Um, and so I've only given you one one type of way to think about this, meaningless or meaningful, but we got another scale for you, one to 10. If you feel like what you're doing these days on climate change is really meaningful, give yourself a high number. And if you're feeling pretty meaningless these days, um, stick to the lower numbers. This is cool. This is really interesting. It's such an even spread, actually. Um, a little bit less on the very top end uh, and the very bottom end, but I think a lot of us are in this kind of muddy middle where sometimes it feels meaningful or when we're in a certain headspace, it feels really meaningful. Um, or maybe sometimes it doesn't. Or if you frame it out to be, you know, a, in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't seem like more than a drop in the bucket. And I, I don't have a silver bullet answer for you on that today in terms of one thing you can do to, to solve everything and to make you feel less meaningless in, in um, this story. Um, but I do want to present to you a little bit more about this framework that we use and this idea of narrative fidelity and how meaning, um, what meaning means in the context of storytelling. Uh, so narrative fidelity is a, a, a term I first saw um, reading someone named Fisher who wrote in the 80s about stories uh, and fiction. Uh, and he talked about this idea of like, when a story makes sense, when it resonates with us, there's multiple things happening. There's that sort of cognitive, logical thing where we understand the beginning and the middle and the end. But there's also something more um, moral or emotional where we only really understand what the story is about. We only understand the moral of the story if we... Uh, if we have some shared values with the storyteller or with the characters involved. And so when all this comes together, um, the challenge of a story, the, the choices the characters make, the outcomes that happen, and the moral that we're supposed to draw from it, when all of that kind of links up, that's what we, that's what narrative fidelity means. And that's what it feels like. Uh, and the, the top row there in the, in the framework is Gans's uh, work that says, you know, we can think about stories most of the time, whether we're talking about the public narratives that shape our lives, like you know why this particular party is gonna get in or out, um, why this climate crisis matters or it doesn't, we can kind of boil these stories down to, um, to these four parts, the challenge, the choice, the outcome, and the moral. And the way that we frame it at Equanxious Stories is what matters, what's at stake, what do we want, and what will it take? And the goal is that we actually can answer this question. And, and even if it feels really big or scary or heavy, that we actually can make a clean line between these different parts of the narrative and know our place within it. But so often we feel the opposite. We feel narrative dissonance. We feel like there's so many different stories going on at once. And if you chose one, you'd have to kind of abandon the others. Um, if you focused on climate change as a, as a challenge, you'd have to stop doing everything else that you do. If you really face the choices that climate change requires of you, that it would, it would ask too much of you or, or that it would ask too much of us. Um, we have a broken heart about this because we know there are choices we, we could be making and should be making today that could actually um, result in, in less harmful outcomes for, for people on the front lines of these issues um, and give us more hope for the future, for the outcomes that we want uh, down the road. And so what's the moral of a story that tells you the world is ending and then tells you your choices to like stop buying plastic bags and change your light bulbs? Like they're totally out of sync and it makes for this tension uh, and this anxiety. And so we work hard at trying to understand these questions through the lens of eco-anxiety because we assume there's going to be some dissonance involved. 
Uh, and maybe we have to live with some dissonance in order to keep waking up every day and moving forward. But let's talk about that. Let's talk about what that feels like and the heaviness around that. And let's talk about choices that we could be making collectively um, to make this less hard, to make this less dissonant and to have what we know and what we love and what we do actually line up and come together. And that's why the opposite of your co-anxiety is not relaxation, uh, it's power. And it's a great quote from Dan Rubin, a, psy a psychotherapist in the Seattle region um, who, yeah, he posted this on Twitter a while back and I just loved, I love how simply he framed this. And I think it makes a lot of sense when you think about um, this brokenhearted story that it doesn't get repaired by um, just chilling out, even though chilling out might make it so much easier to actually move through these different parts of the story every day. Nothing wrong with, with coping with these feelings and having some great tools in your toolkit to do so. But I think that the, the ultimate answer here is power shifting and actually using our stories to link up, connect with each other, dig into what we love and what we, we would what we're grieving and actually use that to, to fuel us forward. Uh, and so we're really trying to, to shift power here by telling stories and working together on them, um, not just sort of like letting off steam. So this is how I've summarized that. We, we talk about act one, act two, and act three. And I think a lot of us are kind of stuck at act one, but act one is all about eco-anxiety as an entry point. Um, you belong, you belong based on when you are, not who you are. And if you feel anxious, it's probably because you've got a really rich story underneath your anxiety. Uh, and if we move that story over to act two, if we don't just fixate on the challenges and the feeling like we don't have any choices, but um, actually dig into our choices and the heart of the story, um, we have the choice to, to work together, to, to share our stories, to focus on our values, to tell uh, how, talk about how we feel, and to do that in a way that's really grounded in understanding that, that we don't all experience the climate crisis the same way. Uh, and my anxiety might be a lot more about what I would lose than, um, than the fact that I'm really feeling the impacts of the crisis here, here today. Um, and so I try to use eco-anxiety and we talk about it in the way that can actually ground us in a sense of courage and compassion, um, a sense of anger and injustice. Like those are all really great mobilizing emotions um, that are connected to eco-anxiety. They don't, they don't replace anxiety, but if we think about their interconnections, um, we can find this source of courage to help us do really brave things. And that's what all great stories are about, are people making really brave choices because they care about something and love something so much. And that leads us to, to action, to act three. And we don't, we don't jump to act three without really taking time in act two at the heart of the story. Um, but we, we do want people to feel like that what they can do in their here and now lives is meaningful. Uh, it could be meaningful at a personal level. If you uh, don't pick up that, gar that plastic bag at the grocery store, that might make you feel like you know when you are in this story and you know where we're headed and you wanna be a part of that new economy, that next thing. So you're gonna say no to that thing. But you also know that this story is so much bigger than your small choice and that you don't have to feel guilty um, about the fact that the system surrounding you do not make for very good choices. You can get angry and you can get organized and actually push back on those, on those choices and those structures. Uh, and we try to talk to people who are, are moving in that direction or who are taking action in that way so that we can help others make the link between their anxiety, uh, their grief or their love and making change at a, at a systems level because that's what feels meaningful. So this is what we would ask you to do if you were in a session with us, or if this was more of a workshop where we were um, taking time to, to share our stories or write down our stories. Uh, if you have a pen and paper in front of you, I invite you to jot down a couple of notes about these prompts. Um, but the biggest takeaway is just thinking about the fact that your story is complex. There's more going on than just a feeling of anxiety. That's just act one. That's just the opening scene where we lift the curtain and we see you in a climate crisis that is hundreds of years in the making, built on myths of colonization and colonialism and white supremacy that are hundreds of years in the making. Um, you are here at this moment in time, this chapter where we see a turning point and, and you, the role that you're going to play in that is up to you in large part. So how does eco-anxiety resonate with you? What's going on there? What is it impacting? Is it something about your relationship to your job or your family or your culture or your land? Or, or what is it? Is it your summer holiday plans that are not possible anymore? Is it, what is it that you feel like you want to um, ground this story in? Where does it show up in your life and what do you do about it? 
then connect that to the heart of your story, your core values. What is it about that thing that actually matters to you? And how can that be a source of courage and compassion for you? Um, if it's your, if it, the things that matter most to you, that's mobilizing. And so take some time to reflect on that. And then connect that to something that feels meaningful to do. And it doesn't have to be on you know, a list of eco-friendly activities. It doesn't have to be um, changing your whole personality so that you can fit in with a new group. Most of us feel meaningful taking action where we are in our own spheres of influence and connecting up with people who, um, who want to join us in that and make us powerful in that. So, so oftentimes act three is not about a hero's story and you feeling like you changed the world by yourself. Um, but it is an invitation to link up with others and to start um, building a community that can help you navigate this story for, for generations to come. This isn't something that's going to be over in our lifetime. So we have to start thinking about building this, the skills and the capacity to carry this forward um, for future generations. So why libraries? This is what I'm, I'm almost at the end here, but um, I saw this again, a tweet from Beth Sawin. She's one of our, uh, she contributed a story to our site and she does excellent work at the climate interactive uh, organization working on multi-solving. And she, her whole thing is about how whenever we tackle the climate crisis, we have this opportunity to make things better from a perspective of equity and health and, and gender equality and disability and all these other things. We can remake our world. And she says, I love the idea of every public school being a site of green innovation, efficiency, health, and care. Next, let's do, next, let's do hospitals and daycares and libraries. Uh, and so I'm really pleased to see this series of webinars come together and to be invited to participate. It's so great that a space that is for the public, um, that is for the people, is telling the people's story and really grounding it uh, in the values of equity and love and justice. And so I would invite anyone here who works for a library or who maybe works for a school or a healthcare institution or just a community group, anyone who's in it for the people and not just for some kind of profit, how can you foster a narrative fidelity about the climate crisis? How can you go beyond awareness and understanding of the science to really think about head, heart, hands, and feet, how all of the, the challenge, the choice, the outcome, and the moral come together? And how can you do that in a way that fosters courage and compassion, especially when it comes to those who are impacted first and worst by the climate crisis? Can, how can we center those stories and tell, um, tell this climate narrative, these eco-anxious stories from a more diverse perspective? And how can you give people an opportunity to respond meaningfully right where they are? So not necessarily just saying take action, um, but actually helping people see how in our community or our city or our municipality, how things are taking shape and what kind of issues are top of mind and really helping people connect with other people who are like them. Maybe you organize um, eco -anxious, an eco-anxious story session with your uh, small group at your church or with your uh, workplace or in your kindergarten class. Um, there's all kinds of ways to start to open up these conversations and give people a, a deeper connection to what's already meaningful to them. Uh, and so I would encourage you to think outside the box and get creative with us um, and how we could maybe partner together to do that. So that's sort of my my last slide and my last pitch, um, this is a completely self-funded project. We don't have any core funding. Just a little bit of Patreon support to keep the website up right now. And so we're always looking for partners and, and people that might want to sponsor a story or share a story with us, help us keep um, really great content on the site so that we can make this uh, a much more accessible and, and uh, easy conversation to start. Uh, and I do this work every day through my company, Dwell House Photography and Communications. Uh, and you can reach me on Twitter or by email anytime to talk more about all this cool storytelling stuff. So that's it for me. And I'd love to take some questions and, and hear a little bit more from you about how this is resonating. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. And, and folks, uh, just a reminder, uh, please feel free to pop your questions in the chat. Uh, and then we'll, we'll make sure Rachel can see them. And just a reminder, uh, we can send uh, the links to the various people and organizations that have mentioned today in the follow-up email as well. The, B the good folks at the BCLA sent uh, just yesterday, uh, the uh, Climate Action Committee uh, prepared a submission for the province of British Columbia's uh, climate preparedness and adaptation strategy. So we can share that as round as well, because that's some really good work has gone into that. Not a question, rather a reminder, please consider BCLA's Climate Action Committee listserv 
folks, you can see the link now in the chat. I really encourage you to sign up for that. Even if you're not in BC, there's going to be good stuff uh, there that I imagine you can use in your work. And if you're outside of BC, maybe uh, through your own uh, library association or another network, you could start a, a local hub or a local uh, climate action committee where you are. Two things, just as um, hopefully we're getting some thoughts in there. Rachel, I've always felt that for me, well, a couple of thoughts. I mean, I know we're hearing, you know, so much about what we're experiencing right now is not the new normal, but the new baseline that for here things get wilder, warmer and weirder. And I have found that for me, hope comes from action. Action usually comes first and then hope generates from that. And for me, it's rarely the other way around. If I just sit in hope, then it tends to become passive. And I'm wondering, there's a couple of comments here that made me think of that. There's one from Nicholas who's saying, I feel empowered by my individual actions, but it feels so overwhelming when our political leaders aren't acting on this issue. And then there's another one from Lisa saying, I have a strong urge to qualify my response. This is in relation to the poll, just saying that meaningful to me, this is what Lisa is saying, is that that's all that I can determine what is meaningful to myself. So does any of that generate any thoughts for you? Yeah, I really appreciate those thoughts. I think to me, both of those kind of, a lot of those statements relate to this, this tension we start to identify between our personal story and our public narrative. And so even the idea that there's sort of two stories at play might be new for some people that, you know, the experience that I'm having and the way I can kind of organize what matters, what's at stake, what I want and what it'll take of me. That's, that's, different or embedded within, but separate from, um, you know, what matters as a whole to society, um, to the global community, what's at stake for the global community, what we want, what, who is we in what we want, you know, the, the, all of these questions start to come out and, and, and our intention with each other. Uh, and so it's useful to, to even just map out um, a little bit of, of, you know, what, what matters, what's at stake, what do we want, what will it take um, from the different from the narratives that you're experiencing. So what if you're identifying that a political narrative um, is really working against your, your personal sense of meaning, what does matter at the political level? You know, is it the economy? Is it COVID, you know, recovery? Like what is going on there that seems to matter? Um, what are the stakes for those kinds of things from the dominant narrative's perspective versus from my perspective as someone who knows about the climate crisis? Starting to, to organize these, these stories that are in tension with each other can, can start to just help locate where, where you fit. And, and Beth Sawin has another great quote that just says, you know, you have a very humble piece of this to do and to take some, some, some peace in that, um, that you finding your piece in, place in this and starting to connect the dots in a more daily way, like that's really, really positive. And, and if you can spill that out into other parts of your life, like that's really great. But I think the more you know about how the world works, the more you want and you crave for that action to really start to resonate at a political level, um, because that's where so many of the rules of the game get created. And so I do encourage people to, to get involved at that level in some way, whether it's through um, direct action and activism, whether it's through like supporting a group that works in the, in the space of advocating for a particular policies, um, if it's supporting land defenders who are really on the front lines of those policies failing or not existing. Um, and just uh, trying to make the link is the best, the best advice I can give in terms of feeling meaningful. Because I do think that meaningful stories are a lot easier to exist in and sustain than dissonant ones. Um, but certainly it's, it tends to come down to this tension between the public and the personal and the role of hope, not just like if you feel hope, but what's the role of hope in, in locating the challenge at hand? And what's, what role does hope play in your life to motivate your choices or to keep your eye fixed on that, that outcome? So I don't think we can expect hope to be the, the, the center point of these stories. I don't think that's useful, um, but find a way to operationalize hope in your story. Think of it as a mechanism that can then pump life into a particular act of this story. And, and it's useful um, and quite personal to figure out what that means to you. Um, where your hope lies, but it, it, it's more useful to me when it when it becomes an active part of this story rather than sort of an outcome that I'm hoping for. Thank you for that, Rachel. That's really helpful to hear. We've got a couple, we've got another comment here from Scott. What freaks me out are things that nobody provides governance and is international in scope. Uh, examples are the tragedy of the commons, economic externalities, not taking into account the real environmental impacts in our 
production. So I'm curious with the work you're doing, Rachel, a lot of us, most of us on this call will not be in the rooms that are setting climate policy provincially, nationally, internationally. Uh, sadly, it's a terribly small group of people uh, who seem very satisfied <laughs> with as little as possible over as long a period of time as possible. Hopefully that will change uh, at, in Glasgow. But I'm curious, what do you see, what are, what are you seeing in terms of sort of impactful and effective at more localized levels of the folks that you're working with and the kind of action that you're seeing, uh, knowing that I really like what you said about each of us has a place, each of us has our own component of this broader narrative. So I'd be curious for your thoughts and what you're seeing as what you feel might have impact. Uh, appreciate that. I think, I mean, it's incredibly multifaceted. Like when you start, I think one thing that keeps people away from, from identifying with the climate movement is knowing that this is a topic that's about politics, that, that is about global governance structures and, and economics and a lot of things that you do need, you know, degrees to really be able to weigh into at the detailed level. Uh, and so one thing that we're really trying to emphasize with this project is that we need those people, we need those people in the room to get this stuff. Um, but if we only focus our attention on those people and that those rooms, well, a lot of us just are here standing around wondering what to do. And that's really disempowering and, and really doesn't reflect a democratic society, ideally, and, and doesn't, even at a romanticized level, like doesn't reflect how care actually happens. And so when I think about this story, not in terms of like climate policy, but in terms of caring society that actually takes care of, of a self community and earth, um, then, then, it, then it shifts a little bit. Then it's less important for me to be in those rooms and more important for me to figure out what kind of society can I build and will I build regardless of what happens in those rooms? And, and you know, for generations, those rooms have failed us. And so what are we going to do in our communities when this happens? So you know, um, a couple of weeks ago when there's a heat wave in BC, um, this is happening. These are climate impacts that are happening already because of decisions that were made before I was born. And I have the choice now to either acknowledge that there's a connection there, um, to acknowledge that there are people who live on the street in my city who are totally exposed to this, um, to try to figure out what groups of people are actually working to um, support those people, support those groups, you know, trying to think about a, a whole ecosystem of care that, that is required and then make the link to say, hey, this is only getting worse. Who is in charge of setting up these systems to be in place permanently so hundreds of people don't have to die? Uh, who is in charge of actually mitigating this problem uh, and linking this back to the fossil fuel industry, to, to, you know, in, um, to utilities, to, to huge industries that are still causing the source of this problem? Uh, and to actually just make these linkages. It doesn't always mean that I'm going to be the one to be in the room, but the, the, the stronger I can make these connections and the more I can use my, my platforms to make that known, um, while actually doing the work of putting care into action, that, that feels meaningful to me and doesn't put all of my hopes on those rooms where people are making these decisions. And it honors the work that you know, women, people of color, and, and others who are not always counted in the formal economy have always been doing and will continue to do when all of that other stuff falls apart and as it all does fall apart. Um, so tune into what, what brings you the courage and the compassion to care uh, and to put that into action. I think that that's where I land these days, knowing that there's so much that's out of my control. Thank you. I, I saw a quote recently that really landed about one of the most radical actions we can do, especially in this structured society, is to build and foster community that deeply cares and supports. There's a great list here from Nicholas in the chat of a number of organizations doing work on climate. I'm going to offer that's one way mm -hmm. to connect and to support is who's already, who's already doing the work totally. and how can I support them? And there's a great question here from Nadia or from Nadia. Um, something that deeply troubles me is the increasingly common response I hear from fatigued folks who have determined their role as consumers is meaningless. The dominant rhetoric for years, coming from powerful corporations, placed the climate responsibility on the individual consumer choices. In other words, people are rejecting their individual consumer power because they see it as part of a huge misinformation campaign. What are your thoughts on that? Interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting way to frame that question because often I'm responding to something kind of the opposite where we're kind of saying, you know, what can I do as a consumer? And, and I'm often encouraging people to think outside that box. But I think there's a point here to be taken that we play multiple characters. I asked, you know, who you are on the scale of one to 10 up to a climate expert, but I could have framed that a hundred different ways. 
Um, and, and who you are, your identity is multifaceted and, and in some ways subjective, like you get to decide in some ways how you identify and what groups and what categories and, and demographics you, you, you are part of. And some of that for sure is society telling you who you are and how they see you. But you get to decide if you frame this climate story in terms of your consumer power. Um, if you are a consumer, what matters, what's at stake, what do you want and what will it take? And does that feel meaningful to you in terms of climate action? For me, it, it only gets me so far. And I think it's an incredibly important thing. Like we, we live in a capitalist society and that is our current reality. And so where I spend my money matters to me for sure. But I also try to think outside of just my role as a consumer and have it in a whole you know, uh, constellation of identifiers uh, and, and sources of power, because my dollar is not my only source of power. Um, and, and my you know, Twitter feed or whatever, that's not my only source of power, but it is one channel. Um, my relationships, my, my political activism, any of these things can kind of be reduced. And, but to me, the story doesn't really add up unless they're sort of considered more holy. And I'm just one person. So think about how you know, that ripples out into um, the public narratives around us. I think the key as an individual is to really get honest about what does make you feel meaningful. If it feels really meaningful to support that company that you support, that's great. Maybe you should tell them. Maybe you should talk about it. Maybe you should um, go a little bit farther with that if that feels really meaningful to you. Um, but I get a little bit discouraged when I see people, you know, either guilting each other about consumer choices or, um, or just reducing to any single identity as the only source of, of a person's power, uh, because we're compl complicated, we're complex, and all of our relationships, um, economic or not, are, are sources of potential power to put to work uh, for the climate crisis. Well, thank you. There's a, we have a, a nice comment here from Margaret, and then we'll, we'll have to wrap up. I appreciate the mental framework of X happened regarding climate change the year I was born. Uh, it somehow retunes my despair into anger which is a more actionable emotion. And Rachel talked about Marshall Gantz. And one of the things that Marshall teaches in his work is that anger, when focused properly, is a motivator. Uh, it's an action motivator. And that's something that I think is useful for us to think about. Um, we're almost at time. Rachel, I want to thank you so much. I want to thank the folks at the BCLA. I want to thank the folks at Public Library Interlink, folks at the co-op, and most importantly, for everyone who's joined this call. One of the questions we asked at the last workshop was what are the places of influence and power that each of us have access to and how can we leverage and utilize those to push farther than we think is possible because that's the place we're in right now. One of the things the IPCC report said is the extremes are here, they're coming, they're gonna get worse. These are the good old days in terms of, of, in terms of weather and temperature, but there's still time for us to avert the worst impacts of the climate crisis. And that is gonna be a collective effort. So again, I encourage you, where are you? What are your places of influence and power? How can you lean in and how can we do this together? Rachel, any final thoughts in our final 20 seconds? Um, just, I love that, that idea that Gans really does encourage us to move to, to putting our anger into, into work. Uh, and I think just as you're reframing your story, expect your feelings to change because um, how you locate yourself in this will absolutely affect your, your uh, emotions. So lean into that and share your story with us. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Uh, the video is going to be on the BCLA YouTube account next week. So uh, please check it out and have a fabulous rest of the day. Take good Thanks. care.